a little bit after lunch and I'm gonna hope to keep you awake. So I'm gonna try to make it a little bit interactive. But first I wanna tell you a little bit about medical device adverse events. So he already went through what I do. Um, I previously worked for the FDA on two different projects, adverse event reporting and also on unique device identification. The UDI project is one that's been rolling out over a few years and it essentially is a barcode that uniquely identifies a device. So that can be very important when you're trying to determine what device you need to report because of a problem. So 95% of the medical devices on the market have not gone through clinical trials. That's very different than the drug side. And so I think most people and doctors included don't know this. It currently takes two months to two years for the FDA to identify a signal. A signal can be anything from 500 malfunctions to two deaths. It depends on the device how often it's used, and it's very uh, subjective. So certainly when medical devices have problems and the problems build up over the years, there have been some enormous lawsuits. There are also a lot of patients that are harmed that have no recourse. It can be because of the device, because of the length of time, or because they were also taking a medication that may be blamed instead. So if anybody here has ever tried to look into MAUD, that's the adverse event system at the FDA, you either gave up or you spent months and months in there. And that's because they have 6.4 million reports and they're not sorted in any way that's meaningful or helpful. So when I worked at the FDA, one of the things that I was hired to do was to replace the MAUD system. Just so you know, it did not go as planned and what they did eventually uh, implement was only implemented for the analysts at the FDA. They never updated the public face. So if you're looking, you're gonna spend a lot more time than the analysts at the FDA would. So about a year after I started this, I finally finished cleaning data. This is just an example um, using Medtronic. This is a screenshot I did when I was building the system for adverse event reporting. And you can see that there are so many different versions of the name Medtronic through misspellings and comma ink, that if you were trying to search in the MOD database to find all instances of Medtronic, you would top out at 500 because they only let you see 500 at a time. So there's no way using MOD you can ever find the true number of events for most device companies. Okay, so I am gonna hop out for a moment and I wanna get online and show you how this works. All right, so this system uh, combines three different sources at the FDA. Uh, know that at the FDA, they don't combine their databases. So there is no view like this that the FDA has access to. So when they're looking at adverse events, the analysts that are doing that may not know that there's been a recall on the device. So this shows you along the left-hand side that there are 6.5 million adverse event reports. This is over uh, since 1996, I believe, is when the system started. If you're viewing the data at the FDA, you can only see 500 reports at a time, and you can only see the last 10 years. So. If you're a reporter and you're looking for numbers for a story and the next month you go back to double check your numbers, they're always going to be different because it's a moving target. So as they add that new month, the same month 10 years ago drops off. And so it can be very difficult to validate data. So since we were talking about cobalt chromium, I want to show you what devices have these issues. So when a, an adverse event report goes to the FDA, typically if you're looking for it later, you have to know what you're looking for. You have to know the name of the device or the manufacturer or the model. And you can't search on, well, what's the device contain? So I built this system in such a way that 
Cobalt Chromium doesn't have to be in the name of the device. If it's anywhere within the report, you can find it. So here you can see that you have 38,000 adverse events that cite Cobalt or Chromium. There's also an acronym that I learned over time, COCR, that's used. And so that was something that I, I didn't know at the beginning, something I had to learn along the way. But you can see here there are 365 death reports with cobalt and chromium listed. And the other thing I want to talk about for a moment is this UDI, or it's called Good ID. That's the name of the database. This system that rolled out with the barcodes, it actually gives you a lot of information about the devices. So when someone asks, well, how do I know if cobalt chromium is in the device that's being implanted, there's now a place to go and look for that. It doesn't mean that it's always there, but it does show you here that if you look, there are 43,000 device components on the market that contain cobalt or chromium, or maybe it's always one, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, and then you can also see that there are 181 recalls that reference cobalt chromium. And now I wanted to show, someone had asked earlier, well, how do I know if it's in my device? And so this shows the company names that make these. And a device doesn't exist in the adverse event system until it's been reported as a problem. And so if it's a brand new product, there may not be any data on it yet, but certainly there are about 65,000 reports every month coming in. And there's no way for the FDA to read all those. And so it puts an extreme amount of pressure on physicians who are trying to use safe devices because they don't have time to read all this. And they assume that the FDA is going to let them know if there's a problem. And when you have this two-month to two-year lag time just to identify any kind of an issue, and I would argue with something like hips and shoulders, it's even much longer than that that you have this huge amount of time that hospitals are at risk, that physicians and patients are at risk. And so one of the things that I found is that a lot of physicians and nurses want to read what other physicians and nurses are reporting. So I made sure there was a way to review these by occupation. So if I wanted to just look at what other physicians are saying about a device, I can pull out all the physician reports and run through those. And every one of these is a report in the FDA database. Now, if it's over 10 years old, you'll see it here. And when you click on the link to see the corresponding report, the FDA, it'll come up blank. Another way to look through this data, and I wanted to give you an idea of, of how these reports are coming in, is I, I've set up some charting. And so you can get an idea, well, this is, is this a problem that's just recent or recently known? Obviously with cobalt chromium, you started to have the issues with hips really get to be known around 2012, 13. And my first day at the FDA as an employee was to go to the hip meeting where they talked about metal on metal hips and registries. Now I'm not a big fan of registries. I was on the task force and I still continue to be involved with it a little bit, but my, my issue with a registry is that, first of all, I can't access it, so of course I'm gonna say these aren't so good. Researchers can access it. Physicians on a day-to-day -day basis, they can't get to registry data, and you have to know what you're looking for to find it in there. So they can be useful for studies, but from the perspective of what the FDA wants to know about, they don't go into these registries and look unless there's a congressional inquiry, and then maybe they'll do that. <laughs> so the FDA even doesn't use the adverse events like they should. For a long time, they were blamed and said, well, you know, the data's too hard to find or the data's too dirty. And so I've made it my mission to make the data usable. And you can see this is essentially the baseline. Any number you see here is probably four to five times higher in reality because of underreporting. So if you see that there are 9,845 adverse events from physicians about these devices, that's a, that's a pretty decent number. And I'd hate to think that it's five times that, but it likely is. The other thing you can look at in here is 
One of the problems that was explained to me fairly early on when I worked at the FDA was that when the analysts receive the reports to read, that the narrative, which is what you see in here, would have reference to a death or some kind of a death type event. But yet the, the box that was checked over here would either be malfunction or injury. And the FDA, they typically, not always, but they typically read the reports in order of importance. So they would look at the death reports first and then the injuries and then the malfunctions. And the problem with that is if you have manufacturers that are under reporting and are checking that malfunction box, those deaths can go unread for months to years. So what I did was I created something called critical events. And I had a couple different names for this over time. Okay, so if I type in death, there are 80 different terms used by reporters rather than saying that the patient died. And so <laughs> what you have then is you have a huge number of reports that you can see here that the PT passed away, patient expired, autopsy, and they go on and on. And so what you can see here is that there were 44,000 malfunction, 44, malfunction reports that mention words like this. And then injuries, 37,000. So you can kind of look to see which companies have a history of doing this. Have they ever been cited for it before? I know of one specifically. Bard had some IVC filters that, or the blood clot filters that they were underreporting, and they were cited by the FDA. So since that, I, I can't get in too much trouble for mentioning it here. But certainly that's one that, that is, it, it pops up quite, quite frequently. The other thing I wanted to show is that as I was learning, and keep in mind, I'm, um, I'm a data person, I'm a tech person. I am not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer. So when someone asks me about a device, often I have to Google it, or I go to this UDI record and I say, okay, well, what is this device? What does it contain? What's it supposed to do? And so I have to do that type of research just to get an idea about the device. There was something that kept popping up over and over when I was looking for superbugs with scopes. And I found that rather than knowing all the different terms like, like I know now, like staph and klebsiella and CRE, what I really needed to do was type in positive four because all of the reports would then say which device had a contamination and what it was positive for. So I had been in touch with um, Senator Patty Murray's office shortly after the paper on duodenoscopes came out about a year and a half ago. And I let them know that when I did the search and did positive four, that it wasn't just the one Olympus scope that had the issue. It was actually Pentax and Fujinon also had the same issues. And so I brought that out. Those, it took about a year and a half for those to get recalled. That just happened over the summer. So when I say that there's a lot of data in here, there really is. So the heater coolers that were used for open heart transplants, there were six deaths in my hometown from that. And I had had some chest pain a couple months ago, ended up in an ambulance going to the only hospital close to me. And I was terrified more that I was gonna get exposed to this device than I was about, oh my gosh, do I have a heart problem? <laughs> so, you know, I, I ended up a couple days later having to get my gallbladder removed and they must have thought I was the craziest patient because I was sitting there saying you're not going to use mesh you're not going to scope me you're not going to use the da Vinci I actually had to turn down a surgeon who wanted to use the da Vinci on me and they said oh well the the scopes are fine now it's not a problem and I said no the other ones have issues too and they said oh well, we fixed the Olympus one I'm like no you didn't I still see reports and you know, within a few weeks, there were some articles out about it. And I have wanted to go back to those doctors that were really pushing me to get ERCP and just say, hey, you know, I, 
you know, I have, I do this for a living. You know, they saw me in my little patient gown and tons of pain and just, they didn't believe me. So I went through quite a bit in those five days. It was eye opening. And then I even tried to request if there were any implants, I wanted to know what they implanted. And I said, yeah, you have to give me the UDI. They didn't know what a UDI was yet. And they're supposed to be putting that in electronic health records. So to this date, I still don't know what was left in me, but if anybody should have been able to get that information, it should have been me. Okay, so I'm gonna hop back. I can do, I'll pull up some other devices for you if we end up having enough time. There we go. You can see here on this list that what I did was I pulled up this positive four and even though duodenoscopes are on this list, they're pretty far down. Well, actually, they're, oh, they're second. This list is, there's a newer list now. So the bronchoscopes have more problems than these. They're also peritoneal dialysis machines that are having a lot of superbug issues. Colonoscopes. And, and think of this in this way. So if you have a device in your hospital and you have an outbreak, wouldn't you want to know which device was used on you, right? So that you can trace the patients back to that individual device. If you have 20 of them and you're not tracking that in your EHR, then you're gonna to have to notify 20 times more people when that problem is identified. And so that's why UDI and claims is becoming kind of important. It's been talked about on the Hill recently, but right now, the push is just for implanted devices. And so I've been trying to use this data to convince them that reprocessed devices also need to be tracked in the EHR so that you can go back and understand whether or not your patients have been exposed to it. So one of the other things that I am battling constantly is, is redaction of reports. When I search in device events, if I type in positive for B6, does anybody know what B6 is? Okay. okay. Freedom of Information Act has two different clauses that the FDA uses on reports. They have one for B6, which is protected health information, and B4 is trade secret. And they will use B4 and B6 in place of saying the number of injuries or in place of saying what the device was contaminated with. And so if I pull up, you know, I can look for mycobacteria, I can look for, you know, CRE, all of these different things. But if the FDA is redacting that information, I'm not going to be able to find out, well, what am I looking for? What do I need to go back? and look for in the EHR? What do I need to look for with, you know, talk to the biomedical engineering folks, um, maybe look into getting some different devices. But as long as this redaction is allowed by the FDA, they've, they've now done it with over a thousand reports. Sometimes the redactions will slip through and they'll start redacting things, but there will be an update to the report and that won't get redacted. And so I'll see, you know, there was, there was a case with three people who got HIV from a colonoscope. And everywhere else in the report, it said that it was redacted so you couldn't see what they'd been infected with. Oh, Candida auris is something that the CDC sent out a notice about last fall. And I didn't know what it was, but I thought, you know, I just go in and I type in anything and see what comes up. And when I did that, rather than seeing that this type, it's considered a superbug, was in a certain device, what I found was that the test kit for that wasn't working properly. And so the test kits that are being used by hospitals couldn't detect the specific type of candida that's actually a superbug. And so Lisa had actually helped me with Consumers Union and we've gone to the CDC to say, are you fixing this? Does Do the hospitals know that this test isn't working, that they should be looking for something else? And 
to my knowledge, the CDC knew about it, but they hadn't really acted on it. There were no notifications going out, either then or now that I'm aware of. So, and so I said I wanted to make it interactive. So what I'd like to do, if we have enough time, and I'm a fast talker, so I've got one more minute. If anybody would like for me to look up something for you, we can either do it now or I'll be here for the rest of the day. And if you have curiosity about any devices, I know that I was pulling up hips a lot earlier and was getting all excited. Oh, 15 minutes, wow, okay. Okay, that's right, because we switched. I have more time. <laughs> yes? What would happen if you put in the Stryker MDM? Okay. Oh man, sorry. Striker. So, 545 physician reports. Oh, cool. Probably did 500 of them. Yeah, and then you can see how, yeah, how recent they are. You can look to see critical events. It looks like there are potentially three deaths, and here only one was checked. So I always have this turned on because I like to just see what the difference is. The system does not depend upon any formal collaboration with the FDA. Nope. You don't have access to the data. And I bring it down. I don't count on their system always being up because it's very glitchy. And the other thing is sometimes they'll remove a report Companies can petition the FDA to remove reports. They'll say, oh, our competitors put those in. Those are false, things like that. So device reports can go away. So, okay, I'm out of time. <laughs>